Thanks for joining us for online worship this morning. Normally, of course, we would be gathered in this place at the corner of National and Grand to lift high the name of Christ together. This morning, as COVID rages in our community and as we have many of our own congregation uh, dealing with that right now and uh, working and praying to get better, we thought it best that we worship from home today. So thanks for joining us today. We hope to be back in person next week, but we'll play that decision week by week. As we worship this morning, I'd ask you to participate with us as if we were right here in this place, to sing when we sing, to open your Bible when we open our Bibles, to give when you have a chance to give, to participate in worship together. This morning, we are gathered together. Although we are separate, we are gathered together through the presence of Christ. And so today we gather together to make much of Jesus. Let's do that this morning.
Hey guys, it's Chris. Happy to be talking to you all this morning. Right now, I'm out running errands. Amy and I are on the road doing things we've got to do. Say hi, Amy. Hi, Amy. And oh, geez. Running errands. My guess is, if you're anything like my kids, you don't really like to run errands with your family. Not the most fun thing you get to do, whether it's Walmart or the bank or the grocery store. All these things, uh, you know, they interrupt what you would rather be doing. They interrupt the fun you're having, the games you're playing, the, the show you're watching. Running errands, you know, for kids especially, not a great time. But I'll let you in on a little secret. Adults don't like to run errands either. Trust me when I say there are things we would rather be doing than going to the grocery store or to the bank or to any number of places that we have to go. Of course, we have to go to these places, though, because it's these places that have the things that we need to keep our life running smoothly, to keep your life running smoothly. We run these errands so that we can provide for our family, whether it's the grocery store so we can cook dinner and make lunches and those things, or maybe it's the bank where we put our money that we earn from our jobs, or the post office where we're sending letters. There are all sorts of things that we have to do that we don't necessarily enjoy doing all of the time. The Bible is full of stories, in fact, of people who do things that they really weren't planning on doing or that might have been a bit inconvenient at the time and for that matter might even have been annoying. They were interrupted in their daily life when God showed up and said, hey, I need you to run an errand for me. And in fact, we're going to learn about one of those folks today. He's a prophet. His name is Ezekiel. And Ezekiel was talked to by God. God called Ezekiel and said, hey, I need you to run an errand. And Ezekiel probably kind of looked around and said, me, come on, I'm busy. I've got these things going on. I really don't, Are you sure it's gotta be me? Do I really have to stop what I'm doing and run this errand for you? And of course God says, yes, you do. And so Ezekiel said, okay, what are we doing? Next thing you know, Ezekiel's traveled out to this valley where God spends a significant amount of time talking to him about the Israelites and about the troubles that they've gone through and how it's going to be Ezekiel's errand to go talk to the Israelites and to tell them that they shouldn't worry, that even though things have been going poorly for a long time, they're going to get better soon. And so Ezekiel does what he's told. He runs his errand. He goes out and he talks to the Israelites and lets them know that things are going to be getting better. God calls lots of people to do lots of things in lots of different ways in lots of different times. God is calling our church right now, our church in a way that maybe we haven't been called before. He's asking us, our church, to run an errand, to look around our neighborhood, to look around our community, to see the people in need, and to do something about it. And so like Ezekiel and like your family and your parents when they go out and run errands, this is just something that we are going to have to do because it's going to make us stronger, because it's going to make us better, because it's going to make our community better, because it's what God calls us to do. And so as we continue down this path together, we're going to remember that we were called in this direction called to run this errand, called to stop what we have been doing and move in a new direction. We're blessed to be able to do that. And it's been fun talking to you guys this morning. Let's have a quick prayer before we move on with our service. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you for this short time. Thank you for the opportunity to run errands for you to be in your service, to hear your call, and to move together in your direction as a family. We love you. We thank you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. On a normal Sunday morning, we would be passing the offering plates during this time. 
And although we can't do that this morning, you can still give. And I want to encourage you to do that. You can give online right now and go to uhbc.org and look at the top right part of the page and you can click through a link and you can give online. You can send your offering into the church office. You can drop it by the church office during the week. You can even put it in a locked mailbox right outside the church. This is a time for us to give back a portion of what God has given to us. And London's going to pray for us as we have our time of offering. Would you pray with me this morning? Dear God, thank you for all that you do for us. And thank you um, for the offerings that we can give and a portion that we can give back to you. Amen. scripture reading today comes from Ezekiel chapter 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, pro, prophesy, 
prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, O oh, my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spear in you and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. Good morning again, church. It's been a while since we've done one of these, so I guess we'll see if we can get the hang of it again. Uh, a week ago, we didn't anticipate needing to go virtual this week at all. In fact, uh, we were supposed to have a guest preacher with us this morning, Curtis Jones, who I'm excited for you to meet and uh, get to hear from, but with adjustments, we decided to trade. Uh, so here I am, and he'll join us next week, whether it's in person, whether we're ready to get back to that, or whether we're still online, he'll preach for us next week, and I'm looking forward to he and his family being with us. This morning, we continue on our journey of renovation. From the passage that Miles read for us earlier from Ezekiel chapter 37, you may remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the necessity of renovation and some specific points of of, of vision and, and some specific points of things for the future. And last week we talked about going back and uh, redigging wells that foundation, or excuse me, that renovation often takes returning to some key foundational pieces like prayer, like uh, evangelism, like love for scripture and, and passion for Jesus and to be his presence in the world. This week we turn our attention to really what is the most important thing of all. Out of anything to do with renovation, out of anything we've already talked about and anything we're going to talk about over this uh, quarter, this first quarter of this new year, the most important piece of the entire process of renovation, and that is the presence and the activity and the possibility and the power of God's hand in the entire process. And what I hope that we'll see today, maybe for the first time, maybe we'll be reminded of it, is that in our lives and in the lives of our families and in the life of our church family, that God has a way of transforming valleys of despair into valleys of hope. Transforming valleys of despair into valleys of possibility. Transforming valleys of hopelessness into valleys of hope. A, a way of making the crooked straight, a way of making the, the rough smooth, a way of making the impossible possible. And that only God can do that. He invites us to participate in that process. He invites us along for the journey. But there are things along this journey of life and this journey of church and this journey of renovation that only God can do. He invites us to participate, but only he can do it. At its surface, this story from Ezekiel 37 is a, it's a strange story. It absolutely is a strange story, but it's not the latest zombie movie, and it's not Rick looking for Carl in The Walking Dead. This is one of those strange Old Testament stories up there with a talking donkey and burning bushes and God making himself known in these strange and unusual and mind-blowing ways. Ezekiel's vision of the Valley of the Dry Bones came to him after God had directed him to prophesy the rebirth of Israel in the previous chapter, in chapter 36. And so God announces through Ezekiel that Israel would be restored to her land with blessing. But that seemed impossible for the people of Israel. It seemed impossible to Ezekiel. It seemed impossible to everybody at that time. It seemed impossible because things weren't going well for Israel, to say the least. She was essentially dead as a nation. Her temple was in ruins. She was deprived of her land, deprived of her king. As I said, the temple was in ruins and Israel was divided and dispersed and renovation seemed impossible. 
It didn't even seem like it was worth the conversation because it was impossible. So God gave the prophet Ezekiel this vision of the valley of the dry bones as a sign of prophecy, as a sign of what was to come. Ezekiel, of course, is one of those that was taken from Jerusalem some 20 years earlier when King Nebuchadnezzar and his siege against the city of Jerusalem finally paid off and he was able to conquer the city and carried back the uh, uh, large numbers of Israelites uh, to be there in captivity in Babylon. And so for Ezekiel, spiritually, he is alone. He's alone. He finds himself in this vision in the midst of this great plain, this great valley. The scripture describes it for us. He's by himself and like a scene from a movie, the Lord has Ezekiel not just stand there and look at it, but he has him look at it from all of these different angles. He has him walk around this valley and look at it from different perspectives. And from every single perspective, as far as his eye can see, Everything that is around him is this great, big, empty valley. And the only thing that it's full of is dry, bleached bones. An army of dry skeletons on the ground. Maybe, the scripture doesn't tell us this, but maybe as Ezekiel walked around the valley from, and looked from, this, from these different perspectives, his mind flashed back to the scene 600 miles to the west in Jerusalem, uh, where years earlier, historians tell us uh, from the time period that the bones of the defenders of Jerusalem were so many that they literally lined the roads and lined the city. And now Ezekiel and most of his people find themselves a hopeless group of exiles in a faraway land. Gone was everything that they knew. Gone was everything that they knew as familiar and comfortable that felt like home. It was, it was gone. The beautiful majestic temple was no longer there. The great city of David was no longer there. No longer the beautiful palace. Gone no more was the priesthood there. All of it was gone. Just gone. So much of their history gone. It would be like the great founding cities of our country being gone, leveled. Philadelphia, no more. Washington, D.C., no more. New York, gone. Our founding documents put in a bonfire or thrown in the garbage can like trash. The Constitution gone, the Bill of Rights gone, and then someone carting us off into some distant land far away that was altogether very different than our own. But it was far more than that. It was far more than about nation for Israel. It was far more than, than about borders. It was far more than that. It was more than a city. It was more than home. It was their very understanding of who God was and what God is and how God operates in the world and how God operates in their lives. It was far more than just nations and borders. Their very understanding of God was wrapped up in all of these things. And all of it was gone, disappeared. Except God. God lets it be known early on in this book that these people may be far from home, that they may be in the unfamiliar, that things may not be in any way, shape, or form like they want them to be, that their city might be demolished, but that God was still active and present and powerful in their lives. God makes known through this vision, uh, this other vision that he gives Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 1, that we sometimes summarize as a will within a will, showing that God isn't static, that he's not stuck, that he's not in one place that he's not confined by buildings or borders or walls or nationalities that he's not that he's not confined by anything in fact god that god is everywhere that there's no place where he does not or cannot exist that there's no uh, people that there's no country that there's no place where God is an active and present in the world. And now 30 something chapters later, God is going to show Ezekiel something else because he's in a hopeless place and Israel is in a hopeless place. And sometimes we find ourselves in places of hopelessness, a place where we feel like th things just are not going to get any better. No matter what we do, things are not going to get any better. We resign ourselves 
We find ourselves in a place of resignation uh, or maybe a place of uh, complacency, a complacent existence because we just feel like it's not going to get any better no matter what we do. A place where we look at our lives or we look at our relationships or we look at the, the things that we love and all that we see around us and all that we see in our own lives is destruction. All we see is hopelessness. Maybe you look at your relationships. Maybe you look at your marriage relationship and you think about that you're not, that it's not what you want it to be. and It feels broken and sometimes it feels hopeless. Maybe you look at other relationships, a relationship with, with a friend or a relationship with a parent or a relationship with a child or a grandchild or a grandparent and it's not what you hope that it would be. Maybe after two years of this, you look at COVID and you think it's just never going to change, that it's never going to get any better, that we're going to be living like this forever. Maybe you even think of church, even this church, and think how hopeless that it might be to think that God could do something amazing in this place and with us. Maybe you think about the challenges of, of COVID and all the challenges of ministry in the midst of that and the challenges of ministry in our context. And sometimes we find ourselves stuck. We find ourselves feeling hopeless. Maybe you think of your relationship with God and think, what relationship? You think that you've maybe learned all that there is to know and experienced all that there is to experience about God. Or maybe there is no relationship with God there for you. And you think of your life and you think of the ways that you've fallen short in your life. And that there's no way that God could ever forgive something like that or somebody like you. That there's no way that that, that could be made right with God. You look out over those things and maybe all you see is bones. Bleached, dry bones. You see nothing but hopelessness and death and despair. Maybe like Ezekiel, you walk around those experiences and those things that you think of. You look at these things. You think about these things. You gaze upon these things. You look at them from every possible angle and every possible perspective. And yet all you see in your life is these bleached dry bones. And if we'll dig into Ezekiel 37 and we'll dig into the Spirit of God and we dig into the rest of Scripture, just like God showed Ezekiel, He wants to show you today that He is a mighty and a powerful God, that He is a loving God, that He is a graceful and a grace-filled God, that He is the God of making the impossible possible. He wants to show you that he can restore relationships, that he loves you and wants a relationship with you, that he loves you relentlessly, even through our messes, that he is faithful, that he doesn't give up on us, that he can bring hope to the hopeless and to hopeless situations, that he can bring renewed and new vision, that he can bring renewed excitement, that he can bring renewed passion to what once was without any of those things, that God can restore, that God is faithful, that, that God can renovate in our lives and in the life of our church and in the life of our city and in our world. And so in this journey of, of, of restoration, we should think together, we should dream together, we should plan together, we should work hard together at what God has called us to do. We should be passionate about those things. We should redig the wells of prayer and evangelism and being all in for the Lord and being all in for the Lord's church. But most of all, we should ask God to do what only God can do. And that is to breathe his breath of life into us and into the life of our church and into the life of our ministries and the hope that we have that we can make much of Christ in everything that we do. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm extremely task-oriented. I tease my mother all the time about always having a list of things to do, but I also always have a list of things to do. And we should be oriented to the task ahead. There's no doubt about that. 
We should have goals and we should have dreams. We should be working to achieve those goals and dreams. We should have things that, that we're working on and we should be passionate about those things. But, but accomplishing the to-do list and, and, and having a to-do list and being passionate about those things, all of that is nothing without God. It's nothing without God. And so, so things in life and things at church and, 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 and things with COVID get overwhelming. But Jesus says, if God cares for the sparrows, how much more does God care for the crown of his creation? You, me, human beings created in the image of God. Life and all kinds of things to do with life. The weight gets heavy, but Jesus said his yoke was easy and his burden was light. We know that whether it's in life or whether it's at church or whether it's in our world or in our families, that change is hard. But Jesus says that he'll never leave us and he'll never forsake us, even in the midst of change. We know that adjustments bring anxiety in life and church, in the world and other places. But God says, don't be anxious about anything, but in all things, with a grateful heart, present our heart and our request to him being separated like a, on a day like today where we can't be together or maybe you've been separated for two years because you've got to be extremely careful. Separation brings concern and a lot of other things, but God says, I am with you. My presence is with you even to the end of the age. Sometimes things seem like they're constantly going uphill and we're just hoping for a downhill somewhere, but we just feel like we keep pushing this boulder up the hill all the time. But God says every valley shall be filled in and every mountain and hill will be made low and the crooked will be straight and the rough ways smooth. Things in life, things with COVID, things sometimes with church seem hard and tough and challenging, but God says don't lose heart because I am near. Life and COVID and so much, it just gets to be exhausting. I understand that. I think we're all exhausted at times. But God says in this world, you will have trouble but take heart because I have overcome the world. Sometimes, sometimes in life and in church and in the life of our families, it seems like our little offering no matter what kind of little offering it is, whether it's money or time or talent, is, is small and it's, it's not earth shattering, but what we give to a God who can take a little boy's lunch and feed thousands of people with it is important and it is it does make a difference. It may be hard sometimes to see the possibilities, but God says in Ephesians chapter one, Paul says, I should say, in Ephesians chapter one, that God may enlighten and illumine the eyes of our hearts. It may seem like there are too many challenges ahead, but God says that he works all things together for good for those who love him according to his purposes. And so we look out on the world and we look out on life, we, we look at all of the exhaustion and the frustration that's going on in our world right now with COVID and other things in our lives. And it would be easy to just say, what's the point? It would be easy for us to say things are never gonna change, but God, but God. God, our God, is, is the God who makes something from nothing. Our God is the God who brings life from death. Our God is the God who brings victory from death. Our God is the God who rules with sacrifice and from sacrifice, who loves relentlessly and who is active in the world and in our lives. We are on this journey of, of renovation, and this journey of renovation is going to take a lot of things. It's going to take all of us. It's going to take us being all in. It's going to take hard work. It's going to take commitment. It's going to take sacrifice and love and encouragement and doing new things. But most of all, more than anything else that we could ask or dream or imagine, any more than anything else that we could do, what it's really going to take is that it's going to take God leading the way and us following. It's going to take God doing only what God can do. 
turning valleys of despair into valleys of hope. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And let's pray together before we sing a song of response this morning. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I, I want to encourage you that although you're sitting in, in your living room or in your car or somewhere else today, rather than in a church pew and in a sanctuary, that God can still speak and lead your heart in the same ways that God is present with you there, just like he is present in the place where we would normally gather. Maybe this morning he's calling you to trust him in new ways. Maybe he's calling you to give your life and your faith and your commitment to him. Maybe this morning, although there's not an aisle to walk down, maybe he's moving in your heart and in the, in, in the hearts of your family to make University Heights your church family. God, we are thankful for this time together. Although it's not in the ways that we want it to be, we are still thankful for this way of gathering and worshiping. And God, on this journey of renovation, whether it's in our lives or in the life of our family, in the life of our church, in the life of our city or the world, God, help us to trust you. We know that you call us to work hard and to get after it, to dream together, to be excited, to have passion about these things. But more than anything else, God, we need you to do what only you can do. Work in our hearts and our lives. Lead us. Help us to follow. Show us in the places in our neighborhoods and in our city and in the world where you are at work and help us to join you there. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's sing together.
before we close this morning, I just want to say a big thank you to everybody who helped put this worship experience together on extremely short notice. A big thanks to Chris and to our worship team, along with Steve Sherrill for filling in for Julie this week as she was uh, in, on her way to San Antonio to watch Landon graduate uh, and from basic training at the Air Force Academy. And a big thanks to Brian Hake for helping uh, put this entire video together so that we could worship together this morning. We will have a decision for next week's worship uh, by midweek so that you can make plans accordingly. Remember that if you want to give online, you can do that. Or if you would like to give in person, you can drop that by the church office this week. The church office remains open, although we're not worshiping in person this morning. I hope that you have a great week, and I hope that we all dream together about what God might do in us and through us for his glory and for his kingdom. God bless you.